The Voyage of the Wee Red Cap by Ruth Sawyer Durand. It was the night of St. Stephen, and Tig sat alone by his fire with naught in his cupboard but a pinch of tea and a bare mixing of meal, and a heart inside of him as soft and warm as the ice on the water bucket outside the door. The tuft was near burnt on the hearth, a handful of golden cinders left, just, and Tig took to counting them greedily on his fingers. There's one, two, three, and four, and five, he laughed. Faith, there be more bits of real gold hid under the loose clay in the corner. It was the truth, and it was the scraping and scrooching for the last piece that had left Teague's cupboard bare of a Christmas dinner. Gold is better nor eating and drinking, and if ye have not to give, there'll be not asked of ye. And he laughed again. He was thinking of the neighbors, and the doles of food and piggins of milk that would pass over their thresholds that night to the vagabonds and paupers who were sure to come begging. And on the heels of that thought followed another, who would be giving old Barney his dinner. Barney lived a stone's throw from Tig, alone, in a wee tumbled-in cabin, and for a score of years past Tig had stood on the doorstep every Christmas Eve, and, making a hollow of his two hands, had called across the road. "'Hey there, Barney, will ye come over for a sup?' And Barney had reached for his crutches, there being but one leg to him, and had come. "'Faith,' said Teague, trying another laugh, "'Barney can fast for the once. Twill be all the same in a month's time.' And he fell to thinking of the gold again. A knock came at the door. Teague pulled himself down in his chair, where the shadow would cover him, and held his tongue. "'Teague! Teague!' it was the widow O'Donnelly's voice. "'If ye are there, open your door. I have not got the pay for the sprigging this month, and the children are needing food.' But Teague put the leash on his tongue, and never stirred till he saw the tramp of her feet going on to the next cabin. Then he saw to it that the door was tight-barred. Another knock came, and it was a stranger's voice this time. "'The other cabins are filled. Not one but has its hearth crowded. Will ye take us in, the two of us? The wind bites mortal sharp. Not a morsel of food have ne tasted this day.' Master, will ye take us in? But Teague sat on, a holding his tongue, and the tramp of the stranger's feet passed down the road. Others took their place, small feet running. It was the miller's wee Cassie, and she called out as she ran by, Old Barney's watching for ye. Ye'll not be forgetting him, will ye, Teague? And then the child broke into a song, sweet and clear, as she passed down the road. Listen, all ye, tis the feast of St. Stephen. Mind that you keep it this holy even. Open your door and greet ye the stranger. For ye mind that the wee lord had naught but a manger. Mir altra, feed ye the hungry and rest ye the weary. This ye must do for the sake of our Mary. Tis well that ye mind. Ye who sit by the fire, that the Lord, he was born in a dark and cold byre. Miro astro. Tig put his fingers deep in his ears. A million murdering curses on them that won't let me be. Can't a man try to keep what he says without being pestered by them that has only idled and wasted their days? And then the strange thing happened. Hundreds and hundreds of wee lights began dancing outside the window, making the room bright. The hands of the clock began chasing each other round the dial, and the bolt of the door drew itself out. Slowly, without a creak or a cringe, the door opened, and in there trooped a crowd of the good people. Their wee green cloaks were folded close about them, and each carried a rush candle, Teague was filled with a great wonderment entirely when he saw the fairies, but when they saw him, they laughed. Oh, we are 
taking the loan of your cabin this night, T, said they. Ye are the only man hereabout with an empty hearth, and we're needin' one. Without saying more, they bustled about the room, making ready. They lengthened out the table and spread and set it. More of the good people trooped in, bringing stools and food and drink. The pipers came last, and they sat themselves around the chimney-piece, a-blowing their chanters and trying the drones. The feasting began, and the pipers played, and never had Teague seen such a sight in his life. Suddenly a wee man sang out, Clip-clop! Clip-clop! I wish I had my wee red cap! And out of the air there tumbled the neatest cap Teague ever laid his two eyes on. The wee man clapped it on his head, crying, I wish I was in Spain! And whist up the chimney he went, and away out of sight. It happened just as I am telling it. Another wee man called for his cap, and away he went after the first. And then another, and another, until the room was empty, and Teague sat alone again. By my soul, said Teague, I'd like to travel that way myself. It's a grand saving of tickets and baggage, and ye get to a place before ye've had time to change your mind. Faith, there is no harm done if I try it. So he sang the fairy's rhyme, and out of the air dropped a wee cap for him. For a moment the wonder had him, but the next he was clapping the cap on his head and crying, Spain! Then whist! Up the chimney he went after the fairies, and before he had time to let out his breath, he was standing in the middle of Spain, and strangeness all about him. He was in a great city. The doorways of the houses were hung with flowers, and the air was warm and sweet with the smell of them. Torches burned along the streets. Sweetmeat sellers went about crying their wares, and on the steps of the cathedral crouched a crowd of beggars. "'What's the meaning of that?' asked Teague uh, of one of the fairies. "'They are waiting for those that are hearing Mass. "'When they come out, they give half of what they have to those that have nothing. "'So on this night, all of the year, there shall be no hunger and cold.' "'And then, far down the street, came the sound of a child's voice, singing, "'Listen, all ye, tis the feast of St. Stephen.' Mind that you keep it this holy even. Curse it, said Teg. Can a song fly after a he? And then he heard the fairies cry, Holland! And cried, Holland, too! In one leap he was over France, and another over Belgium, and with the third he was standing by long ditches of water frozen fast, and over them glided hundreds upon hundreds of lads and maids. Outside each door stood a wee wooden shoe, empty. Teague saw scores of them as he looked down the ditch of a street. What is the meaning of the shoes? he asked the fairies. Ye poor lad, answered the wee man next to him. Are ye not knowing anything? This is the gift night of the year, when every man gives to his neighbor. A child came to the window of one of the houses, and in her hand was a lighted candle. She was singing as she put the light down close to the glass, and Teague caught the words. Open your door, and greet ye the stranger, for ye mind that the wee lord had not but a manger. Mihor etro. Tis the devil's work, cried Teague, and he set the red cap more firmly on his head. I'm for another country. I cannot be telling you a half of the adventures Teague had that night, nor half the sights that he saw, but he passed by fields that held sheaves of grain for the birds, and doorsteps that held bowls of porridge for the wee creatures. He saw lighted trees, sparkling and heavy with gifts, and he stood outside the churches and watched the crowds pass in, bearing gifts to the holy mother and child. At last the fairies straightened their caps and cried, Now for the great hall in the King of England's palace! Whist! And away they went, and Teague after them, and the first thing he knew he was in London, not an arm's length from the king's throne. It was a grander sight than he had seen in any other country. 
the hall was filled entirely with lords and ladies, and the great doors were opened for the poor and the homeless to come in and warm themselves by the king's fire and feast from the king's table, and many a hungry soul did the king serve with his own hands. Those that had anything to give gave it in return. It might be a bit of music played on a harp or a pipe, or it might be a dance or a song, but more often it was a wish, just, for good luck and safekeeping. Teague was so taken up with the watching that he never heard the fairies when they wished themselves on. Moreover, he never saw the wee girl that was fed and went laughing away, but he heard a bit of her song as she passed through the door. Feed ye the hungry and rest ye the weary, this ye must do for the sake of our Mary. Then the anger had Teague. I'll stop your pestering tongue once and for all time, and, catching the cap from his head, he threw it after her. No sooner was the cap gone than every soul in the hall saw him. The next moment they were about him, catching at his coat and crying. Where is he from? What does he hear? Bring him before the king. And Teague was dragged along by a hundred hands to the throne where the king sat. He was stealing food, cried one. He was robbing the king's jewels, cried another. He looks evil, cried a third. Kill him! And in a moment all the voices took it up, and the hall rang with, I kill him, kill him! Teague's legs took to trembling, and fear put the leash on his tongue, but after a long silence he managed to whisper, I have done evil to no one, no one. Maybe, said the king, but have ye done good? Come, tell us, have you given aught to any one this night? If ye have, we will pardon ye. Not a word could Teague say. Fear tightened the leash, for he was knowing full well there was no good to him that night. Then you must die, said the king. Will ye try hanging or beheading? Hanging, please, your majesty, said Teague. The guards came rushing up and carried him off, but as he was crossing the threshold of the hall, a thought sprang at him and held him. Your majesty, he called after him, will you grant me a last request? I will, said the king. Thank ye. There's a wee red cap that I'm mortal fond of, and I'd lost it a while ago. If I could be hung with it on, I would hang a deal more comfortable. The cap was found and brought to Teague. Clip, clap, clip, clap, for my wee red cap. I wish I was home, he sang. Up and over the heads of the dumbfounded guard he flew, and whist, and away out of sight. When he opened his eyes again, he was sitting close by his own hearth, with a fire burnt low. The hands of the clock were still. The bolt was fixed firm in the door. The fairy's lights were gone, and the only bright thing was the candle burning in old Barney's cabin across the road. A running of feet sounded outside, and then the snatch of a song. "'Tis well that ye mind, ye who sit by the fire, that the Lord, he was born in a dark and cold byre. Mir as throg. Wait ye, whoever ye are, and Teague was away to the corner, digging fast at the loose clay as a terrier digs at a bone. He filled his hands full of the shining gold, then hurried to the door, unbarring it. The miller's wee Cassie stood there, peering at him out of the darkness. Take these to the widow O'Donnelly, do ye hear? And take the rest to the store. Ye tell Jamie to bring up all that he has that is eatable and drinkable. And to the neighbors ye say, Teague's keeping the feast this night. Hurry now. Teague stopped a moment on the threshold until the tramp of her feet had died away. Then he made a hollow of his two hands and called across the road. Hey there, Barney. Will you come over for a sup? End of The Voyage of the Wee Red Cap